Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. I hope that you had a blessed start of this year, the beginning of this year. And yeah, we could really hope and pray for nothing but for God's work to continue, God's work in us and through us to continue. And before we would like to begin, I just like to invite each and every one once again to bow their heads with me and let's pray. <clears throat> Our faithful Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Lord, thank you for the year that ended for us and a year that is here once again. Father, we thank you for every year that passed reminds us, oh dear Lord, of how faithful you have been to your people ever since until today. And so once again, as we continue to go back to your word and get to know you more and better, I pray, Heavenly Father, for your spirit to be in the midst of us. Again, we claim your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be in the midst of them. And so I ask, Father, that may you dwell in the midst of us, though we are physically apart from each other, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would unite our hearts and allow us to be able to receive your message tonight. Thank you so much once again for being with us, for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so once again, it is my joy to be with you once again here in um in the final herald and greetings from the philippines a good evening and a happy happy new year here from the philippines and let's go to our study for tonight and this is this was my study uh, the last day of 2020 and until the first to the third until the this week the first week of of the new year and so let's open our Bibles and let's go into the book of Genesis. Genesis. So I have been quite reading Genesis since the last part of last year of 2020. And it's a very beautiful book. And just the experiences of people that are here in Genesis are, are amazing. And truly, I think everywhere in the Bible, but truly when we when we go back into the word of God, he he gives us, you know, he 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 would just give us the strength, the encouragement, not just the kind of encouragement that you know, like do not give up, not just that kind of encouragement, but encouragement that gives strength for us to do what what we are actually being encouraged to do. And so let's open our Bibles into the book of Genesis and let's go and let's open it into chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. So here in Genesis chapter 15 and the very, and the chapters before this and also the chapters after this, when we go through, it's the story of Abraham. Yes, the story of Abraham. And if you were here last time, I shared as well about the story of Joseph. Yes, and his family, starting from Jacob. And it's just somewhere here as well, just close. They're just like beside each other. But this time we're going into the story of Abraham and his family and much more about the God that is with Abraham. Again, the title of tonight's message, of God's message tonight is Jehovah Jireh. And so let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Let's start from verse 1. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, and Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall be thine heir, but he, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And so, during this time, it says in my Bible, this chapter 15 from verses 1 to 6, it says, God encourages Abraham. 
And so what did happen before this specific part of Genesis chapter 15? What had happened before this? During the time, we all know that Abraham was together with his um, nephew, right? With his brother's son, Lot. And so they went to Egypt, and then after Egypt, they, they decided to, to separate. There was a little conflict. It's not really a conflict, but maybe between their herdsmen, between those who were taking care of their um of their cattle, of their sheep. And so they decided to, to separate. And so they went the other way. So they separated together. And then during that time, Lot decided to go uh, close by Sodom. And so that's where he pitched his he stand, that's where he stayed. And also Abraham went the other way around. And so during that time, there was a, a battle that happened. And during that time, when there was a battle, it says here in chapter 15 and verse 11, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals or all their food, and they went their way. Verse 12, and they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So they they both uh, departed from each other, or they both separated. Lot went this way, and Abraham went this way. And then there was a battle that came, and so Sodom, they were attacked. And so uh, um, during the battle, all their goods, all their foods, and everything that they you know they possessed, it was taken from them. And it says here in verse twelve of chapter fourteen of Genesis, it says, and they also took Lot which is Abraham's nephew, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and, and departed. And so, and then it says here that there came one, verse 13, and there came one that had escaped, that, that escaped from that capturing and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite. And then it says here, in verse 14, and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive or Lot was taken captive, he, ar he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto, unto Dan. And he divided himself against them and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of, of Damascus. And then... Abraham, together with his soldiers, he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So what happened was they engaged as well in a battle because he, he couldn't just stand there at peace where he is staying, you know, where there's no battle or where there's just peace and knowing that Lot was captured. And so he was moved that he needs to rescue Lot. And that's why he came with his trained and his armed men. And then what happened was um, they were able to, to succeed on what they have, uh, what was their goal, which is to, to rescue Lot and other people that comes with him. And so what happened after that, it, that was the time that, you know, other kings went to, went, went to Abraham and they started to pay him honor because knowing that he's a wise man, his good, his, his strategies are really, you know, and they started to look up to him. And, you know, Abraham's life was actually at peace. When you look back at it, the reason why they separated is because there was a little conflict between, between the, you know, the earth man of Lot and, and Abraham. And so even Abraham himself says, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my earth man and thy earth man, for we be brothers, we are brethren. And so you could see that Abraham is not really the kind of man who is war freak. Is not really that kind of man, but he would always seek for peace between between people, and you know he he would always seek peace between relationships, right? And so we can see that for what happened between him and Lot. But then, you know, when this time happened, and knowing that you know he 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 lives a peaceful life, and the Lord has has tremendously blessed him. He could not bear and just sit there and relax knowing that Lot was captured. And so they rescued them and they rescued them successfully. And then what happened after that is, you know, since he engaged in that battle or he engaged or he inserted himself in that 
you know, in that conflict between different um, kingdoms. And so what happened was he thought at once that, you know, now that people knew this and that, it won't take long that this this kingdoms or this people where where they have you know persecuted or which they have um slewed would you know rise again and would target them and you know would 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 have vengeance or would come back and would as well fight them or battle with them and so there was a time that um abraham would think you know his life was very peaceful and all of a sudden he involved in this kind of battle and of course the peace in 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 his life was disturbed the peace in his life was disturbed and so he was thinking we're not even in canaan yet we're not even in canaan yet and this this is happening and you know since we involve our our ourselves in the battle people can just come back unto us and you know and 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 how to call that and revenge and all those things and we're not even in canaan yet and and god's promise is not yet fulfilled that i will be fathers of many i will be a father of many nations and so he was he was you know he was um disappointed maybe but you know he was um it was this chest that time and that's why here in genesis chapter 15 there comes a time that the lord renewed once again his promise and his covenant into abraham and that's why god says fear not abraham do not be scared when when these people would come back to you when these people would avenge do not fear abraham i am your shield and thy exceeding great reward and so Abraham is asking, I don't have a child yet, and the promise is not yet fulfilled that I will be a father of many nations. We're not yet in Canaan. And, and here the peace is disturbed because we joined or we went into a battle with another or with another kingdom. And so the Lord has assured him, I am your shield and thy exceeding great reward. And then in his despair, in verse, in verse um five of Genesis 15, follow me, Genesis. 15 verse 5 and he brought him forth abroad god brought abraham and it says out of his tent and he said look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them and he said unto him so shall thy seed be isn't that amazing of a promise when 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 abraham was in despair and when abraham was in the point of discouragement that's when the Lord once again, it's amazing how in the life of Abraham, every time Abraham is discouraged and, and needed to be reminded of this, of this promise of God's promise of God's covenant to him, the Lord will always be there and ready to, you know, to encourage him, ready to give him the strength that he needs. And isn't that a great promise for each and every one that when we depend on God, when we do not seek for people's advice first than God, right? And every time we would come to him in despair, he knows how you know how disappointed we are. He knows how 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 much our longing of strength is in our hearts when when unlike other people whom we whom we would like call on to and you know ask for advice. I mean, it's nothing wrong with that. I, I as well do that. I as well ask for people to pray for me. But it's a great thing when you can see here how. You know, between Abraham and God, the Lord understands that at that very moment, he needs to be encouraged and that the Lord will be there always ready to encourage, not only encourage, not just as simply encouraging, you know, Abraham, I am this, I am that, I, I will be your shield, I will protect you, not only just by words, but by, you know, but everything that he says is a promise that he will do for Abraham. And that for me, my brothers and sisters, is really amazing. And verse 6, it says, And he believed, and Abraham believed in the Lord, and he counted it for him, to him for, for righteousness. And let's go to um let's go to 16, Genesis chapter 16. And so what happened after that again in Genesis 16? When we go fast forward, is here, it says here in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bear him no, no children, right? That was why, you know, um, Abraham was um, in despair there in chapter 15 because um, his the promise is not yet fulfilled. He's not yet the father of many nations and they're not yet even in Canaan. And it says here in Genesis 16 verse 1 that Sarai, Abraham's wife, bear him no children. 
and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing, and I pray thee, go in unto my maid, which is Hagar, and, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened, and the, the voice of Sarai. And then what? Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid. After Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, he gave her to her husband and Abraham to be his wife. So let's, let's try to think it in our own time, <laughs> right? So since that the promise that you know that Abraham will be a father of many nations and it says in verse 15 in in, in Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 that what when God reassured Abraham once again of his covenant with him it says in verse in verse 6 or yeah, in verse 6 of Genesis 15 that that Abraham believed believed on God and you know, Abraham believed on God and that is good. No, that is good that Abraham believed in God. And so the thing is, what happened in verse 16 is that it says here that Sarai, Abraham's wife, could not bear him a son or could not bear children for him. And so he had this handmaid, which an Egyptian and her name is Hagar. And so Sarai had this idea, since I can't bear a, a child, what if Sarai bears a child for us so that when, you know, when she gives birth, then we will take that and that will be our son. And that, you know, because the Lord has promised that you will become a father of many nations. How then can you become a father of many nations if you don't have a son or if you don't have children, right? Which is true. And when you looked at it in the human nature of thinking, Sarai has somehow has a, has a point, you know? He's some, she somehow has a point in it. And, you know, how can, how can Abraham then become a father of many nations when they don't have a son? So, and you know that, that, will, that that's how the promise will be fulfilled. And so, but again, do not forget, it says there in Genesis 15, verse 6, that Abraham believed God's covenant with him that he will be a father of many nations. And so that happened. And then, you know, um, say a uh, Hagar and Abraham, they were together and they had a son and they called him what? Ishmael. And then verse 17, verse 17 came and verse seven, uh, I mean, chapter 17 came verse one. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Lord I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou and be thou perfect. You know what's amazing? He was already, what, 90, 90, 99 years old that time. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and he said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. He is already 99 and the Lord is still saying to him, you believed on me. I said, I will multiply thee. I will what? I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. And then he says, and behold, my covenant is with you. And thou shalt be a father of, of many, of many nations. And, you know, it's amazing how he was already at that age. And, you know, before they, their lives last, way longer than we we that people are today than we are today and you can just imagine how maybe how old is when we compare 99 before to our age today but i'm sure that it is not young <laughs> i'm sure that it is not young and it is not the you know the usual age for you to to still have a son or to still have a child but the lord once again what the Lord once again reminded and renewed his covenant, his promise with, with Abraham. And then it says here in, okay, it says here in verse 9, in verse 9 of chapter 18. I know we've been moving forward, fast forward, but let's go to Genesis chapter 18. Let's just connect them story together, right? So Genesis 18, it says here in verse 9. It says, 
And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, he is in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Right? Now Abraham and Sarah were old in verse 11 and were stricken in age. And it ceased to be, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. And then therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now that I am, you know, I am old and I mean, like, why, why now, right? Why at this age will I have a son or will I have a child? Right? And then it says here, and the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a, and Sarah shall have a, Sarah shall have a son. The Lord says that in the time that I have, in the time that I have permitted and in my will, in my will, in the time that I have placed for Sarah, I will return and Sarah will have a son, even, even in she is in her old age. And then Genesis chapter 21 came. And we all know Genesis chapter 21 is where what? Where Sarah had, had born a son and they named him Isaac Retreat. Uh, Genesis 21 verse 1 and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said right as he had said there in in chapter 18 when the Lord says is there anything too hard for the Lord at the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son he says in the time appointed I will return unto unto thee and so the Lord it says here in Genesis chapter 21 the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had had spoken that he will return into the appointed time and Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him see Sarah bore a, a son and they called him and they named him what? And they named him Isaac. And then we all know what happened into that after that, right? After that, it didn't really just, you know, and they lived and they had Isaac in their old age and they lived happily ever after. It didn't happen right like that because just right when when um when Isaac, the child that was born, the son that was born unto Sarah, just when he was growing, what? The Lord had permitted Abraham's faith to be tested, right? And that the test of his faith was for his only son that he has been awaiting, not only him, but including his wife, Sarah. And they even had made their own solutions just to get you know, to get a son or to get a child that the promise for him to be a father of many nations can be fulfilled, right? And so his only son and their long-awaited son that the Lord had allowed and that his Abraham's faith to be tested is for him asking Abraham to, to offer his son unto the Lord. And it was not an easy journey for Abraham that day when they started to, you know, journey going to, to Moriah, going to the mount where the Lord has appointed for them to be and to offer his son as a burnt offering. And so for three days, they traveled Abraham together with his son and two other men who were with them. And you can just imagine how, you know, for a long time, a lot of nights that the Lord, that he was discouraged that the Lord needed to bring him out of his tent and show them the stars. And just for him to be reminded that the Lord will fulfill that which he had promised, even in the time that, that, that Abraham didn't see or can't see any proof of that covenant to be fulfilled in his life. And so there are so many things and so many had happened in his life and his faith relationship with God. And here it comes that the Lord was asking his only son, his long awaited son to be a burnt offering. And you can just imagine how, how Abraham would feel or how heavy his feet gets during that time as he walked going to Moriah, right? And knowing that, you know, 
knowing that his son was given to him and the Lord has blessed him with a son and he loved him. I believed he loved him so much. And then the Lord is asking him right now. It may be like, it's like in our time, in our time, we could say the Lord has given it, but then he would take it, you know, and did not even allow, um, did not even allow Isaac to be, to be, to be old or way older, at least he could enjoy it, spend a lot of years more with his parents, bond with them, you know, for him to to ask Abraham for Isaac to be offered as a burnt offering. But then, in in you know, in Abraham's faith to God, he he obeyed. He followed he followed the Lord without questioning, and there they came, and you know, he he to to offer to offer his son to offer his son as um as the offering as the offering to to God. And then let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. It says here, this was the call from God in verse 2. Genesis 22 verse 2 and he said, "Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. And that was the call. And that was the test for him. And so they traveled, they journeyed because Abraham accepted the, the call of obedience. But you know what? They could, you know, during the three days journey, that was a long journey. Maybe in the first, in the second, or even in the last, they could, could turn around and go back, take a U-turn and go back to, to, to their home. But he didn't. And then it says here in verse, in verse 7 of chapter 22, Genesis 22, verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb of a burnt offering? He says, Father, there's a there's a fire, there's a wood, but where is the lamb? Because you know, growing, growing up, Isaac growing up, he has been witnessing the kind of faith his father Abraham had. And so you know in times that he would offer into the altar and he would be praying. And so he knows the practice of what they're doing, that you know, there has to be a lamb that is to be offered. And that's why he asked. He said, there's a fire and there's a wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together and they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Can you just imagine? And, you know, a lot of, a lot of maybe those who are watching here are parents. I'm not yet a parent. I'm, I, I'm still single. And so, but I'm trying to imagine the kind of, you know, how, how a father like Abraham would feel during that time. You know, he's not happy doing this, I believe. He's not that, okay, Lord, I will obey you. And, you know, he's excited to obey the Lord, so he will slay his son. I believe it's not that. I believe that, you know, in his heart, he desires to obey the Lord. And his faith tells him to obey the Lord, no matter the cost. But at the same time, as a father, in his heart, I believe that there was a pain in his heart. There was a great pain. There was a great pain in his heart knowing, knowing that, you know, it is his beloved son. It was his long awaited son. But what's amazing, I would like to read it to you from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. It says here, it says, Abraham unfolded to his son, Isaac, the divine message. It was with terror and amazement that Isaac learned his faith, but he offered no resistance. Isn't it that amazing that really Isaac is like a lamb because there's no resistance. You know how a lamb and like a goat and like a, and, and a lot of a lot of people would always share this, uh, that as an illustration or comparison between a goat and you know and a lamb how, how how they are different or even other animals how when they are about to be slain how they restrict and you know they they do everything just to you know be able to to go away from that point but how lamb would just you know at times cry even and they don't even resist that they, they have that character of of deep submission 
the deep submission of even it comes to you know slaying them and taking their lives they they, they have that they have that and you know it's just amazing how 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 Jesus the son of God was specifically specifically compared into a lamb, a lamb because that was his his character and so it says here like Isaac as well he learned his faith that that's you know he will be born and that he will be offered as a burnt offering but he offered no resistance and it says here Isaac had been trained from childhood to be ready tr trusting obedience and as purpose of God was open before him he yielded a willing submission he was a sharer in Abraham's faith and he felt that he was honored in being called to give his life as an offering to God isn't it that isn't that amazing that, you know, as he was growing up, he became a sharer of his father's faith. And it's amazing how, you know, Abraham as a parent, as a father, had opened unto his son his faith. He did not, you know, at times I, I, I have a four-year-old. I have a four, um, I have a four-year-old niece. And at times you would think that, you know, you know, should I, should I open to her this already or that already? Maybe this is too heavy for her yet. Maybe she will not understand it. Most especially when it comes to your faith. But then reading this and going through this, it's amazing how, you know, Abraham was very open with his faith too, to Isaac. That even Isaac at a young age had developed that faith in him in his very own life and it it is so amazing for me and it says here that what because he became a sharer of abraham's faith of his father's faith he felt that he was honored in being called to give his life as an offering to god for you to be offered to become a burnt offering to be slain you feel honor for you to be in that position and i believe that not unless the spirit is in the heart that person will never feel honored for that person, if I will be as a burnt offering, I can't imagine myself if, you know, unless I will be possessed by that divine spirit, by that Holy Spirit, and that, you know, my perspective and my mind will change. And it is just, it is just really amazing. And it says here that Isaac tenderly seeks to lighten the father's grief and encourages his nerveless hands to bind the cords that confine him to the altar. Isn't that amazing? Now, Isaac understood what was, you know, what was his father feeling that time, how, he fought, how his fathers feel. And so it says here that when he knew that he will be slain, he will be offered as a burnt offering, he sought to, to, in, to lighten the father's grief. Maybe he started to encourage him. Maybe he, he speak, you know, Father, I know that I, you love me and you do this, but, you know, you love God and I love God. You know, he could have said words to encourage his father. And it says here that he even he encouraged his father's nerveless hands to bind the cords that confine him to the altar. As a father, he didn't want to, to tie. He didn't want to bind Isaac and to slay him. But even Isaac himself not only yielded his right, but even encouraged his father to do it for the Lord. Isn't it that amazing? As a parent at times, how, you know, the children can become a blessing to parents. When the parents have lived a faithful life by God's grace and had open his his or her faith to to the child and one day when the parents is discouraged the child himself would become the spokesperson of god to speak words of encouragement to the parents and that that is beautiful that is beautiful and and that was and it says here and now after binding and after placing him at the altar the last words of love are spoken and the last tears are shed and the last embrace is given. Wow. The last words of love were spoken. The last tears were shed and the last embrace was given. Because, you know, both of them, both of them desired to, to obey the Lord. And it's so amazing how there was an, you know, Isaac, though he will be slain, he was feeling honored and he takes the joy. He takes the joy to be offered to God. And what's amazing is that it says here in Genesis 22, verse 11, 
when Abraham finally, you know, lifted, took, lifted his, stretched forth his hand and, you know, took the knife to slay his son, verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him. He lifted his eyes, he looked, and he saw behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in, this, in the stead of his son. Verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Isn't that amazing how, you know, the Lord says, do not do anything unto your son because now you have proven unto me, you have proven unto me that what you will not withhold anything from me, even your only beloved son, you will not withhold it from me. And I can just, I'm just trying to imagine the kind of relief that, you know, that fell or that kind of relief and peace that fell. But I believe that even before that, when, you know, when they gave their last embrace, they shed their last of tears or said the last words of love, they both have peace. They both had peace. Even they were delivered in that test, right? They, 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 there was peace. And so I can just imagine the relief and the joy that, came dropped into Abraham's heart that time and there's something that I want to to point here and then you know out of joy he even named the place he even had he even expressed himself you know his joy by naming the place Jehovah Jireh Jehovah Jireh and we all know what Jehovah Jireh right Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide and the Lord will provide but let me um let me share with you tonight, let me share with you points that um, I was, the Lord has blessed me upon studying this, this life of Abraham. You know, Abraham is called to be the father of faith in the Bible. And just knowing his story tonight, or just going through once again his story tonight, would make us agree that he was not just randomly picked to become the father of faith. Or, you know, it was just not randomly that the Lord just gave him, ah, oh, Abraham, okay, let him be the father of faith. No, it was just not randomly that that name or that title was not randomly given to Abraham. When you look at his life, what had happened in his life and the test that he had to go through and by God's grace succeeded, you know, he indeed is the father of faith. He indeed is the father of faith. And, you know, Abraham's life was not that, you know, he is, yes, he is the father of faith because sometimes we would think, wow, Abraham is the father of faith. Wow. You know, there's that wow factor that the Lord has declared him to be the father of faith. That must have been wow, like really his faith, but wow. And we would, and that would connote, you know, an idea that, you know, who else in this world today can, can, can be a father of faith, Right. Who else can manifest the kind of faith of Abraham? And, and that factor would think us, you know, and would somehow create in our mind that the impossibility. That's impossible, you know, that's Abraham and that's, wow, the father of faith. But that's impossible to happen today. Or that's impossible for me to live. That's impossible for me to live out the kind of life that Abraham lived. And that's, that, there's that connotation that comes into Abraham, the father of faith, because it's, you know, it's, wow, wow, he's a father of faith. But really, when you look at the life of Abraham, it was not, it was not a perfect life. It was not an all life of faithfulness, you know. It is not that kind of life that all the way he was perfect and he even succeeded into offering his son. You know, it's not that, it's not that kind of life. Abraham, this is a reality when we go back to the Bible. That's why it's very important to read the Bible because it breaks every impossibilities that we think is impossible. When we go back to the Bible, then the Bible would remind us that Abraham himself had a share of unfaithfulness in his life. 
He has his own share of unfaithfulness, just like each and every one of us were here tonight. Or each and every one of us who will be listening, listening in this message. You know, Abraham, just like you, just like me, had his share of unfaithfulness in his journey with the Lord. And that should encourage us. That should encourage us because though he was called the father of faith, his life was just like us. He had a share of unfaithfulness in his life. But then you would ask, if he then had shared of unfaithfulness in his life, why is he then called the father of faith, right? If he's not really a perfect, perfect faith because he had a share of unfaithfulness. At times, Abraham grew weary like us. And we had unbelief in our hearts, right? And we even doubt and we get discouraged. And at times we get discouraged for sure. Our faith or our grip on the Lord and to his promises was loosened and there is some unfaithfulness that took place in there. But you know what's happened? Even in, in the actions of Abraham, there was unfaithfulness. His heart never stopped desiring to be faithful to God. His heart never lose that you know that that longing to be faithful to God to be obeying God not for anything but because of his love for God and that's something that that's something that we should all think of that you know it is not impossible to live the kind of life that Abraham lived you know why one thing you know why why I am so sure that it is not impossible for us to live out the kind of life that Abraham lived why because we have the same God. Because we have the same God that was encouraging Abraham all the way before. We have the same God today. And since Abraham has his own share of unfaithfulness, he only became a father of faith. Not because he was all so faithful, but because God was so faithful in his life, even in the midst of his unfaithfulness. Even in the midst of his unfaithfulness. And you know, and that's one thing that I really want to lift up that point today. And this was very timely when I was studying this because that was, you know, the 2020 was about to close and the opening as well of 2021. The kind of life of Abraham, that's what he called the father of faith, was not, you know, like, yes, he had a share of unfaithfulness, but it was not this kind of life. Wow, I am so unfaithful, but the Lord is still faithful for me, to me. That is grace. That is grace. And you know, that is why I mean, like, we are blessed. Each and every one of us are blessed, whether we recognize it or not, that God is so gracious to each and every one of us. But Abraham's life was not like, you know, even in my unfaithfulness, God is faithful to me. I believe that he's not, his life was not kind of that. We all go through that phase of life that we would realize that, you know, wow, you know, last year, and exactly, this is how I exactly was conversing with the Lord when I was studying this. You know, Lord, 2020, when I looked at it, I can see nothing but my unnumbered faith, faith, unfaithfulness. You know, when I look at 2020, I know like, I mean, in the past years, I have been, I have not been so faithful, but you know, just 2020 has just brought so much unfaithfulness. I just have so much unfaithfulness in me. Especially when the Lord started to help me recognize even the small and faithfulness that we don't even recognize in the past. And I would just look at it. I said, Lord, I have so much unfaithful. I'm so unfaithful. And you know, that's what the life of Abraham is teaching us. That's the kind of life that Abraham is teaching us that, you know, we are not to be content with the kind of life that the Lord is faithful to me, even if I am unfaithful. We should not be content, brothers and sisters, with that kind of life. That it's okay to be unfaithful. It's okay to be compliant because, you know, the Lord, whatever, he is faithful. He is gracious. The life of Abraham is teaching us that we are to strive harder and higher with the kind of faith that we have with God. And so the question is, how is your faith relationship with God today, tonight? How is your, how is your faith relationship with God if you will ask me, you know, started uh, started this during the new year, I started to pray, Lord, I don't want to live the kind of life that I've lived in the past year, where I just always recognize that, you know, in my unfaithfulness, you are still faithful. I mean, it's not really wrong. It's not wrong that, you know, I mean, it, that is true that even if we are unfaithful, God is faithful to us because he is a God who is gracious. But 
I believe that it is wrong when we start to be content and when we start to be satisfied with the thought that it's okay to be unfaithful because nevertheless the God will be God will be faithful to me. I encourage each one of us to desire a higher faith walk or to desire a higher faith relationship with God this year, even in the year to come until Jesus comes again. Let's not be content with the kind of life Let's not be content with just receiving grace. Let's start appreciating grace, you know, and responding to grace. The Lord is gracious, my brothers and sisters. He is gracious whether we recognize it or not. But when we recognize it, when we start to recognize it, it is not proper. I believe it is not proper. It is not, it is not out of sincerity when we don't respond or we don't appreciate that, that grace that the Lord has given us. And, you know, in the life as well of Abraham, I also um, learned something very, very beautiful for us to, you know, for us to learn tonight. And I know that some of us have learned this or maybe we have just forgotten this. But it says there that as Abraham journeyed for three days going to Moriah, to the land of Moriah, to offer Isaac as a burnt offering, all heaven is watching. I don't know if you recognize that. All heaven is watching at every step of what will Abraham do. Is he going to go and obey? Is he going to not obey? Is he going to, you know, walk and contemplate and then at the end, turn a U-turn and go back? You know, is he going to withheld or to withhold his son? Or is he going to, you know, is he going to obey? with unquestioning obedience, all heaven was watching of what Abraham would do that time. And you see, brothers and sisters, angels have always been fascinated with the fact of, you know, of the kind of sacrifice that Jesus, Jesus did for the humanity. You know, angels were always amazed. And, you know, Maybe they even have a question, how can, you know, because they know Jesus, they know him to be, you know, to be the son, to be the son of God and his position there in heaven. And how is it that him having his throne, leaving his throne and come here and experience the life of sin or experience the people and to be in the midst of sinners, right? They have always have fantasized on that and they have amazement and there are times that they cannot even fully comprehend why and how and what is that you know why did just did just took place and you know what it says here in still in patriarchs and prophets it says here that when the command was given to abraham to offer up his son the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted with intense earnestness they watch each step in the fulfillment of this command and it says here it says here the light when when that happened finally when 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 abraham gave his son isaac when he did not withhold his son from god it says here then the light was shed upon the mystery of redemption even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. You know, because they keep on trying to understand how can the father give his only beloved son for the world, for the sinners, right? For him to be, can, to be afford to, to give his son and to allow his son to live to live. It's like if it's like, you know, in our or, or in the world view, it's like getting a prince from the royal family here on earth and allow him to live in in the slum you know i mean like how can his parents would afford to do that right and so there's like maybe in in, in their maids or at home or, or their servants at home would, would then wonder and would not even realize or would not even understand that kind of love or that kind of of provision but you know when abraham finally succeeded in the test it says here that there was a light that was shed upon the mystery of redemption and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. Isn't it that amazing? In the test of faith of Abraham, the angels learned. 
in the test of faith of Abraham that by God's grace, he succeeded. He succeeded. The angels learned from him. And isn't it that amazing and very honorable to think of that in our trial or in our test of faith, right? In into the test of faith or even to the severest test of faith that all heaven is in view, right? For them to better understand the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. And the thought that, you know, all heaven is watching. And every time we succeed in our test of faith, in our trials by God's grace, we help educate the heavenly beings about salvation. We help them and we, we help enlighten them of the kind of, of sacrifice that Jesus had placed in our behalf, of the kind of provisions that, that God has given unto us. And I don't know about you, but, but just thinking of that, it makes me think that it's an honor to go through tests of faith. I know that it's not easy to say that, and it's not easy to go through every test of faith. It's not easy. It's not easy. I tell you, it's not easy. But to think that way and to look into that kind of perspective when it comes to trials, to test of faith in our lives, isn't it that that makes us like Isaac? who would yield himself and who would yield his right and to think that it is his honor for himself to be offered unto God. You know what's amazing? Because every test refines us, purifies us so that one day, one day, you know, we can be presented before the Father, still not in our own purity, not in our own righteousness, but through the merits of his Son, Jesus Christ. And Let's go back to our title, Jehovah Jireh. I don't know how many people you have said in, or how many people you have encouraged in your life and you tell them the Lord will provide. I know that it's not only me who have said and who have spoken those words to people. My friend, God will provide. My friend will come to me discouraged because, you know, they don't have, um, they lack um, uh, finances for their tuitions. And then I would tell them and encourage them, God will provide, my friend. You know, people who have no food or no this and no that and who, has, who lack things which they need or even people who, you know, who lack things in the ministry and you would encourage them, my friend, believe God will provide. But, you know, I would be very honest to you to tell that, you know, in those times when I says God will provide, all I would think is that he would provide for example, a ministry, they need finances to support their ministry. And I says, God will provide. I, at the back of my mind, as I say, God will provide, is that God will provide finances for them. Is, it not, is that what you're thinking as well? When you say to people, God will provide. When you say to people, God will provide, what's in the back of your mind is what they lack. That God will provide that. But upon going through the story of Abraham, it is so amazing to realize that Abraham called the place God will provide. What, what was provided for Abraham that time? A burnt offering instead of his son, right? Instead of his son, it was provided. Instead of his son, there was a provision made, a burnt offering instead of his son. And what was that burnt offering? That's a, that's a sacrifice, right? That's a sacrifice. That's what they, they do to offer. And I was blown away to realize that, you know, Jehovah Jireh does not only mean God will provide. You don't have food, God will provide, my friend. You don't have finances, my friend, God will provide. But it blew me away to realize that Jehovah Jireh does not only mean God will provide money, God will provide food, God will provide shelter, God will provide clothing, or God will provide this, or you know, whatever. Jehovah Jireh in the life of Abraham actually meant God will provide a lamb. God will provide a sacrifice that you do not need to sacrifice. And when we looked at it, who is the Lamb of God, right? John says, behold, the Lamb of God that's slain, that, that what? That takes away the sins of this world. When he, was, when he looked 
and saw Jesus. And so Jehovah Jireh, my dear friends, does not only mean God will provide anything or God will provide material things. Jehovah Jireh in the story of Abraham reminds us that God will provide Jesus. And I don't know about you, but the promise says that he who what? Who did not spare his son for us, but delivered him up, delivered him up for us all. How can he then not give us, not how can he then not freely give us all things? But isn't it the amazing? And the Bible tells us that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. My dear friends, I know we have been sharing Jehovah Jireh to everyone. We have been encouraging them, God will provide. But I hope that from then on, from now on, every time we would tell people that God will provide, I pray that we would assure them that, you know, you need finances right now. But I, I tell you and I assure you, God will provide his son. God will provide Jesus. Are you in despair? Are you disappointed? Are you worried for anything? My dear friend, God will provide his son. The peace that his son has, he is the light. Are you in darkness? God will provide Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he is also the light. He is also the lamb. My dear friend, Jehovah Jireh, and I hope that we all remember that in the smooth and in the difficult times of our life. Remember that God has provided Jesus in our behalf that we don't need to sacrifice anything. We don't have to offer anything such as how Abraham offered Isaac. You know, Jehovah Jireh is not only God will provide anything. God will provide his son. God will give Jesus he has given him to the cross, and I believe until today, whenever we are in need of his spirit, he will send it. He will provide it, my dear friend. God will provide the greatest thing that this world cannot offer, that this world cannot provide for any of us in any kind of need and circumstances in our life. And as what I have told you, in the story of Abraham, that let's not be content with the kind of life. Let's not be content with the kind of life that it's okay to be unfaithful because nevertheless, God will stay faithful. I hope that you tonight, each and every one of us, being reminded that it is not impossible to live the kind of life or the kind of faith that Abraham lived. Why? Because Jesus will provide Jesus or God will provide his son. And every day when we ask for Jesus to live out his life within us, to ask for the Holy Spirit and to manifest the same spirit that was in Jesus, my dear friend, it is so possible. It is so possible to live out the kind of life or to live the kind of faith or even surpass the faith of Abraham. You know, to to live that kind of life. And, you know, here's, here's a fact in our human nature. As I was praying this, I said, Lord, I don't want to be content with the kind of life that it's okay to be unfaithful because you are faithful. Lord, please take me higher. Allow me to experience things that, you know, that will enhance my faith. And, you know, as I pray this in my human heart, suddenly there was a fear, you know, Suddenly there was a fear because I do not know what this year will bring or I don't know what kind of trials or test of faith the Lord will bring to me this year by me asking him for a greater faith. I do not know. As I was praying and that fell in my heart, I started mentioning it. Lord, you know that as I pray right now, there's just a fear in my heart. There's a fear in my heart because I don't know the kind of test that you will send or you will allow me to to face this year because you know just for like for abraham he was asked to offer his his son and so that's a that's a great test and i don't know what kind of test can be great for us today but so i started to pray lord there's a fear in my heart and i know that you can see my heart how i have fear right now but then as i was praying i was reminded of the promise that love conquers fear Love will drives out fear. And God says, God is love. The Bible says, God is love. So it goes back to that. Yes, there's fear, but love will drives out fear. And that love is God himself. 
And so whenever we have fear in asking that the Lord will help us enhance our faith, we don't know what trials will be before us and we may have that fear, but know that God is there. That Know that God would stand and would take that fear for us. And so that's my, you know, that's my prayer for each and every one of us today. Let's live a year with a greater faith, greater than we've had in the past years. And we do not expect a smooth year, my dear brothers and sisters. But we, we can expect that a God greater than we have ever known him before will be with us. And so once again, let's, let's just bow our heads and let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you and thank you so much for tonight. Father, we praise you and thank you for reminding us once again tonight that truly nothing is impossible with you, that nothing is too hard for you. Father, we praise you for you are a God so, so powerful, so strong, a God who is not discouraged with our unfaithfulness, a God who is strong enough, O oh Lord, to, to bear with us. Father, I would like to thank you for reminding, reminding us once again tonight that Abraham went into difficult, way difficult. We can't even, even imagine the intensity or the severeness of the test that he had with for his faith. But Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us that we have the same God that Abraham was praying to. We have the same God that Abraham was conversing in the past. We have the same God that, that kept on renewing and reminding Abraham of his, of his covenant. We have the same God who has fulfilled his promise to Abraham. We have the same God who will fulfill his promise to us today. And Father, what greater, what greater assurance will be there, oh dear God, than having you by our side. Having you in the in the victorious and even in the severest test of our lives. Father, I would like to pray for my brothers and sisters who are listening. I don't know who among of us here are are facing are are even in the midst of, of a great test in their life right now. But I just want to pray, Father, that May you continue to remind them that God will provide the greatest solution into all problems, and that is his very son. I pray that this very soul listening right now who is experiencing this great test in his or her life, I pray that you will continue to lift, to lift this son or this daughter and allow him or her to see Jesus, to look at Jesus, the lamb that God has provided. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that having Jesus for us will be having more than enough that we will ever need in our life. I pray that may you continue to, to be with us, empower us, oh dear Lord, in the midst of, of fear that we might have as we face the tests of faith that, that is before us. I pray, oh dear Lord, that may you please help us to not run away from it, but have help us, oh Lord, that in fear to run to God, to run to you knowing that you and you alone can conquer the fear that is in our hearts. Help us, oh dear Father, to not be complacent and to not be content living a kind of life who, who takes for granted the grace that you give. But help us, O oh Lord, to be encouraged every day. Help us to be reminded that we should not be content with the kind of faith that we are today. We are barely scratching the surface of faith that the Lord desires to impart to each and every one of us. And so I pray, Lord, that every day you will remind us of that prayer and that longing and the, the desire to live a greater faith with you because it is not impossible, Lord. It is not impossible. And so we praise you once again. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.